Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jack Nyman, and I'm the director of the Stephen L. Newman uh, Real Estate Institute, uh, your host for today's uh, conference here at Brew College. It's wonderful to see you all here today, and, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you to the second in our series of sustainability shop talk uh, events. We designed this series to help the real estate community accelerate its progress towards sustainability goals. We launched it uh, last November with an event uh, titled Pulling Off a Successful Inside Job. It explored how an integrated approach to creating sustainable uh, interior environments can cut costs. Uh, as the subtitle stressed, at a time when savings matter more than uh, ever. Now, four months later, savings matter even more than ever indeed, uh, far more than we could uh, have imagined last November. A recent headline says it all. Developer cuts tower from 76 stories to 38 stories. Tower near City Hall put on hold 38 stories short of goal. Talk about cutting your carbon footprint. Uh, this was surely not what Mayor Bloomberg had in mind when he rolled out his Plan NYC 2030 uh, nearly two years ago. The question clouding uh, everything these days, of course, uh, the economy. What does its downward momentum, as economists chillingly put it, mean for su the sustainability agenda? Are economic forces now in play lending momentum to that agenda or slowing it down? It's dominated by energy issues, of course, and in a beautiful convergence, saving energy uh, cuts our carbon footprint and cuts building operating costs. What's more, regulations requiring greater energy efficiency seem likely to grow stronger. So getting ahead of the compliance curve certainly makes good business sense. And increasingly, businesses that boast sustainable features enjoy a competitive advantage uh, in the marketplace. It would appear to make sense for all property owners and tenants to enhance green leasing right now, particularly in situations in which leases are being renegotiated to reflect changing market conditions. But they haven't all embraced it. Why they haven't, how obstacles to green leasing can be overcome, and the benefits that green leasing can deliver are our subjects this morning. We'll be focusing primarily on existing buildings, and while sustainability encompasses far more than energy, for example, water conservation, energy will be our principal concern. But even these narrower subjects are vast. And importantly, a green lease is a document. However, green leasing is a process that begins prior to lease negotiation and extends well beyond the execution of the lease. What's more, the legal dimensions of green leasing uh, and related tax and financial advantages can become highly technical. Uh, and hopefully, we'll dis demystify some of that technicality today. Future Shop Talk events will explore some of the green leasing issues we can't address today. And uh, this morning, we'll aim to illuminate the incentives and disincentives that shape the realities of the marketplace and core green leasing concepts and opportunities. Happily, the cast of speakers and panelists we've assembled is uh, exceptional. It's truly an honor to host them today. Uh, you'll find their bios in the printed material, so I won't spend uh, time reciting credentials. I'll introduce our first speaker by simply saying that he's regarded as second to none in his knowledge of why so much of our city's building stock still wastes energy so extravagantly. Please welcome Condi Condianas, President and Energy Engineer Odyssey Energy Solutions. Connie. Thank you all for uh, coming today. And uh, thank you very much, Norma and uh, Jack, for inviting me. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time today, but what we want to cover is uh, a quick description of a hypothetical building. The hypothetical building, in our case, excuse me, being, just do that, uh, a 600,000 square, square foot 1978 construction uh, office building. Let's just call it somewhere in Midtown. Uh, this is going to be 
a building that has some problems. It is wasting energy. We're trying to figure out where, why, how, what we can do to get this building to save a little bit. Um, the problems that I confront relate just to the building operation. The problems that you all are here to discuss go far, far beyond that into who's going to pay for it. How is this, what is the mechanism that's going to make this project happen? But for now, let's just scale back a little bit, talk about the building itself. Again, reasonable sized building, multi-tenanted, it's got a central heating and cooling plant. We're not going to talk about a building that, you know, where each tenant has its own heating and cooling equipment. This is a central system. Uh, has still the original equipment installed. It's 1978. The building's not that old. Uh, some of the tenant lighting has been retrofit. Some of the tenant lighting, some of those tenants have been in there for quite some time, so the, the lighting is still original. Uh, and we do have a tenant condenser water loop that's serving uh, data rooms, server farms that the tenant has, that the tenants may have. They're individual excuse me, their individual and specific cooling needs that might extend beyond the hours that the central plant's operational. So where's the energy being spent in this building? This is a um, conglomeration, I don't know if that's the right word, it's more of a, uh, an average of what we've seen in about 60 buildings very similar to um, our sample project here, um, where the energy cost distribution lies. So we see that the tenant loads, being the plug loads and the lighting, account for roughly half of the building's energy cost distribution. Uh, conveying systems a small part, and then kind of three almost equal chunks of energy, being the ventilation, the cooling, and the heating energy in the building. So. How much is this all costing us? Well, again, having a reasonable sample of buildings where we've been able to collect data, this is how badly our buildings are bleeding. And this is dollars per square foot. So we see that virtually all of our buildings are over $5 a square foot. Now, we've averaged out some things like the tenant lighting and the plug loads so as not to penalize any one particular building because they have uh, an energy intensive data farm or server in them. But um, what you see is the, the variation that's attributable to the type of heating and cooling system in the building. And then we have about eight different types of, or eight different permutations, if you will, of those heating and cooling systems. So again, we're looking at $5 a square foot plus $3 million a year for a 600,000 square foot building. The building electric load shows quite a bit of variation, not only by the hour of the day, but by uh, the, the, the time of year, the season, if you will. And these are some charts that we've been able to uh, pull out of, again, this, this fairly large sample of building data to show hypothetically what's happening in our building. Our building's peaking around 3,000 kilowatts, 3 megawatts, and that's happening in the middle of the summer. This is a peak day.